Good evening and welcome to the special election 2018 edition of Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Tonight we feature a debate between the candidates for Arizona's 6th Congressional District, which covers the northeastern part of the Phoenix area. This hour-long debate is a joint effort between Arizona PBS and the Arizona Republic. Joining me to moderate is Yvonne Winget sanchez political reporter from the Arizona Republic and azcentral.com. Tonight's debate is also being live-streamed at azcentral.com. This is not a formal debate. It's an open exchange of ideas, an opportunity for give and take between candidates. Interjections and even interruptions are allowed, provided that all sides get a fair shake. We'll do our best to see that that happens. And joining us now for tonight's debate, in alphabetical order, Democrat Anita Malik, a former journalist and the former chief operating officer of a content technology company. And the Republican incumbent, U.S. Representative David Schweikert. Each candidate will now give a one-minute opening statement. With that order determined by random selection, closing statements will be given in reverse order at the end of the debate. We begin with Representative David Schweikert. Um, first, I want to thank you for doing this. Um, these are wonderful opportunities to have a discussion and dialogue. Um, and, and I guess my thought experiment that I'm going to try to talk through this evening is how far we've come. If you think about where this community was just a couple of years ago, understand where we are in employment, in, in wage growth, in opportunity, particularly even when you see um, so many of our brothers and sisters in this community that you would have considered having a, had a really rough decade. And now even those without high school education and now their employment, um, Hispanic, African-American, female, We've come so far, and my desperate hope is we can continue to adopt policies that continue to bring this sort of economic renaissance to our community. All right. Thank you very much. And now, Anita Malik's opening statement. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you to ASU, or excuse me, Arizona Horizon and AZ Central for having this conversation today. As a former chief operating officer, a former deputy director at Arizona State University, and a small business owner, I have spent many years trying to bring every voice to the table, to listen first, to bring people together, bring differing opinions to the table, and get things done. That's what I see lacking in Washington today. And I'm also a mom. I grew up in this district, and I'm the daughter of immigrants. My parents came here for the American dream, and that dream did not include our politicians being bought by special interests and corporate interests. That's not the dream they saw. The dream that would take away our right to fight for health care, to protect our Social Security, to make sure our education was fully funded for our children. I'm fighting for our children, and I hope to earn your vote. All right. Thank you both very much. Let's get things started. Uh, Representative, your opponent talks about getting things done in Washington. Mm -hmm. What have you gotten done in Washington? Um, I've actually been very blessed. In, in this last term, I actually moved up to the Ways and Means Committee. Um, but some of the, I think, big accomplishments, particularly for Arizona, have been everything from the Jobs Act, which two-thirds of the package were pieces of legislation, the capital formation, um, some of the great success specifically for our community, is my personal fixation on Valley Fever. And now having gotten almost $94 million into Valley Fever research. Um, and then most recently, uh, working on everything from the trade issues, and some of this gets a little geeky, but there was something called seasonal tariffs that would have really hurt Arizona agriculture. And I was able to get that out of the negotiations on NAFTA down to actually things in the um, tax reform that were specifically designed to help us here in the Southwest. As far as your experience, mm -hmm. um, this, this is someone who's now sitting on ways and means. He's right. been in Washington for quite a while. We've just heard some of the things he's done. Why should voters decide to make a change? You know, you sit on the Ways and Means Committee. That is true, and that's the concern. We look at the tax bill that was passed last year that really is creating what has been going on in this country, which is a wealth divide. I don't know how we can say that, you know, yes, you might have accomplished some things in these years, but I think most people in this district feel like what you have said about the deficit, what you've said about protecting that, that economic conservatism, where has it gone? That tax bill is not supporting the middle class, and that is why I believe the GOP is trying to pass version two of that tax bill right now as a political tool right before the November elections. And to say now that this one will protect the middle class is admitting that it, the first one didn't and that it is furthering that wealth divide. 
respond, yeah. please. Ms. Malik, I'm, I'm sorry, but your, your math is quite wrong. Um, look, um, first package, under the old tax code, with all of its gimmicks and its loopholes, the top 20% of income earners paid 84% of all the federal income tax. Today, under the revision, the rewrite, they no longer pay 84, they pay 87. Turns out 87 is bigger than 84. So, and you're already actually seeing it in the data. And look, the tax reform has only been around for 10 months now, uh, nine months. Um, take a look at what we're already seeing in, we'll call it the, the lower half, the lower third quartiles of income movement. There's even some preliminary data out there that for the first time in decades, we may be seeing income inequality actually having some gap closing. Not because the wealthy are not getting wealthier, but because many of our brothers and sisters in the lower quartile are actually finally seeing income rising. So can you explain to me what you've done to that income rise? Because I'm not seeing that. You know, I am part of the working class of CD6. That is the reason I am running is that I have seen that Americans are stretched paycheck to paycheck. 78% of us are going through that. Mm -hmm. Even people that make a substantial living. Why? Because you are focusing on tax breaks and things for corporations. Yes, I know 87 is larger than 84, so thank you for that condescension. Um, but what about the corporate tax break? It, that me, corporate it, tax break is what I'm talking about. It, forgive me, and it was meant to be condescension. I was, uh, um, the fact of the matter is, first off, if you actually look at the joint economic um, or calculations um, from um, the, the tax foundation down to um, joint tax, mm -hmm. turns out the corporate tax part actually pays for itself. When you did the repatriation dollars, the economic growth, that's the data from the independent calculator. Mm -hmm. um, so the goal here was very, very simple. You can't have our brothers and sisters in our community make more money unless we had a productivity gain. And we'd gone a couple decades with no productivity gain. So the tax reform was actually designed to maximize vitality in the economy. And look, the early data is pretty yeah. impressive right now. Are we, I mean, we're seeing corporate stock buybacks. I don't think we're seeing, you know, yes, some companies have given bonuses out. To me, that's a short-term Band-Aid. That's a fix. What we're not addressing, what has not been addressed in the last two years or while you've been in office, has been the cost of living. So, so do you object to the BLS's calculations on Arizona having some of the fastest growth in wages? Is that because of the tax cuts? Um, actually, I think it may be a combination of the tax reform, some of the regulatory reform, and many of the other things we've done over the last that year. That wage growth has not just happened over the last year. Actually, it has. That's what no, my no, point is. That actually, you're we wrong. We have brought in, the tech sector in Arizona has grown. We've, they brought, we've done an amazing job locally to bring in innovation. That's actually not the math. Um, if you actually go, and anyone that's watching, um, go to the um, Bureau of Labor Statistics, go look over the last three quarters, and take a look at the first quarter and second quarter for Arizona, and that's actually where the spike in income growth has been. I'm going to interrupt here. Um, Ms. Malik is running in um, a cycle, during a cycle, that is uh, very favorable to women. It's favorable to minority women. You are of Indian descent. Mm -hmm. um, you have been in Congress for many years. Well, eight years. Why should people stick with you? Um, I'm hoping it's actually because, look, I accept, um, I sometimes geek out a bit on the math. And um, my fixation is, how do I make things work? I believe I've actually done that well. And if you look at the things we've accomplished for the community, I, I, I believe if you do an honest assessment of the math, it's there. Do you, you talk a lot about geeking out. Do you think you could do a better job of communicating oh, yeah. um, those positions with your constituents? Yeah, th there's no question. Um, look, um, I I in some ways I'm in the completely wrong profession um, right now. I'm a bit of an introvert. Um, I'm more comfortable with the spreadsheet sometimes than, than you know the people that do press releases every 20 minutes. And I know in modern politics, look, I've gone years now without a press secretary because I wanted to use those resources for another researcher. I had a PhD in physics on staff up until a couple weeks ago because we were trying to do the hard things. How do you deal with the demographic crisis in the country? We're getting older very fast. How do you deal with the largest unfunded liability in our society, which is Medicare? There are solutions. There are wonderful, elegant solutions. They're just hard. And how are people receiving your message, Ms. Malik? Is your campaigning across the district, and how are you uh, 
trying to reach them and how are they, how, how is that message resonating right. with them? Right, we thought, well, you know, people are really receptive to the idea that, look, there is a time for change, that time is here. The idea of being a representative means you show up and you represent. And you, Mr. Schweikert, have called town halls theater on this very program, I believe, mm -hmm. with Ted. That is not acceptable to people of this district. You need to show up. You need to hear them. It is not about theater when people need to have access to their leadership. Giving them an opportunity, and not just by phone or not because you do individual coffee meetings, giving people an opportunity, busy people with kids and busy lives, to say, I can come out and I can have my voice be heard. That's important. And we are also looking at corruption. We have to address the issue that you're under, under an, an ethics investigation, and people in this district are concerned about that. Mm -hmm. That is not settling for people. And for you to pass it off as you know, a, an accounting error, a clerical error, shows a lack of accountability. Okay. It wouldn't let's, have gone this well, let, far. Let's, well, let's get a response but, First to off, um, having done, been someone that did lots and lots of town halls, I found they did become theater. And so we actually did this thing of I meet with everyone. I've met with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, from even from the fringe left to the fringe right to those in between. Because what you found is when someone had pain, had a difficulty in their life, needed to talk about an IRS problem or a Social Security problem or a veterans problem, they couldn't do it in a forum where people are yelling and screaming. And you had to sit down and, and look, um, uh, I've given out my home phone number. Even early this morning, I met with an older couple just to talk about those things. In regards to the ethics issue, look, it, it, it hurts a lot. Um, my chief of staff, um, we've had to actually go and audit everything. Look so far, there's no sin, but we're going to have to clean up a lot of paperwork. And it's even the same. I'm going to have to clean up some of my paperwork, but it really is bookkeeping. There's nothing dodgy. Yet the House Office of Congressional Ethics looked at this, and as with a grand jury looking at something, and they referred it. They found something wrong. They didn't like what they saw. And, and it's still under investigation. My, my question to you, did you okay purchases for impermissible purposes? No, no. And did that's your chief a, of staff do that? Um, actually, the question there is, did my chief of staff get reimbursed beyond the income limits? Because here's what happened. We had a professional compliance firm that actually was logging things as income instead of reimbursement. So we're having to unwind all of that. And it's hundreds of entries. And it's going to cost a lot of money, and it's going to take time, but it truly is bookkeeping. What about campaign receiving improper donations from that chief of staff and from staffers? That's another allegation. Yeah, there. it's an allegation, but I think we've actually already documented, and now we will actually have the committee, hopefully have our day where we'll lay it all out, and I think we're going to be quite fine. Did he, your chief of staff, exceed outcome income limits? No. In the audits that have been done, no. And now we have to present that. So you have, you've characterized this as a bookkeeping issue, an accounting issue, but these are some of the same accountants who have worked on very high profile campaigns and have not come under this kind of scrutiny. For example, yeah. Bush-Cheney campaign. How, how, can, how can this simply be an accounting error? Look, um, I don't know. That's actually one of the things that happens when you get in a position like this. You try to do your work and you hire professionals to do your bookkeeping, to do your accounting. And in this particular case, we've actually now had to bring in a different professional firm to audit the other professional firm. Is the scope of the investigation limited only to these expenditures? Does, it, has, does the scope include anything oh, else it, that it, voters need to know about will, before they cast their ballots in November? Trust me, the committee will actually go up and down almost everything in my life my chief of staff's life, and that's just the nature of it. Accounting error, bookkeeping problem, miscommunication, it all will make sense. It will all come out in the wash. You know, I run businesses. You come from real estate, tax, and accounting. So to, for it, still, to me, it's not okay. It's not okay to say this is an accounting error. The fact that your chief of staff has repaid money back into the campaign after these allegations came out shows us something. Like you said, Ted, the fact that they've opened this, the subcommittee was opened, that means they believe there's substantial evidence. Um, so to me, yeah, we'll find out. Unfortunately, we won't find out until after the election, the way this has been structured. And so. My question to you, Representative, 
bookkeeping error, problems, people not doing what they're supposed to be doing, or maybe mm -hmm. just oversights, whatever it may be, yeah. it's still all on your watch. And it is. And look, ultimately, I'm the one that has to have responsibility for it. Um, I'm not happy about it. It weighs very heavy on my heart. Um, but we'll get it fixed, and we'll get it um, properly laid out, and um, we'll, we'll demonstrate good faith. Did the, did the chief of staff, did you ask your chief of staff to resign over this? Um, we had a conversation saying um, it, it would be best, I think, it would, because we were going to break down every piece of paper that had ever been filed. And so it had to happen. So corrective action has been taken. Oh, we, we've actually, remember, we're the ones that actually brought the packet to the committee saying, please look at this. So, and we will continue to do that. It's just the process is so slow. And in some ways, the process feels like the punishment. At what point did you learn about these issues? And what was your immediate response to them? Um, it was in January. And I was actually sort of shocked because you get the reports from the compliance firm saying things are fine. And then all of a sudden, you get a different report saying, well, maybe they not, may not be. And um, at first, you have trouble trying to understand why you've been paying all these fees. But it, 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 we will fix it. Um, not happy about it, but it will be fixed. OK, you've heard the explanation here. Mm -hmm. Are you buying the explanation? No, and here's why. When Oliver Schwab did resign, that wasn't the messaging that you gave the press. It was that he was, you know, we all saw through that, and it was corrective action. Why not be honest with the voters? Why not say that's why he was resigning? Why say it was for family reasons? Why always put up a facade? If you really have these reasons for not having town halls, have that conversation with your voters. You have been absent. That is why it makes people well, hard actually, to in, trust. Actually, trust you, is a very important factor You can't factor have it both here. ways, because just a couple well, moments ago, you said on this show, we talked about my fixation of meeting with people one-on-one. -on -one. I think, actually, if I've done it on live television, we have explained. Your fixation was not meeting with individual voters one-on-one. -on -one. What you said was you meet with small groups to talk about policy. And we've seen that as you've been campaigning over the last two months or so. You're meeting with groups at ASU. You're showing that on Facebook. That's a different conversation than your constituents. That's a different conversation than the mom that's concerned about her student and worried about the kids in their classroom having guns. That's a different conversation than the woman that approached you because she was worried that her husband was dying. And that film is all across social media and what mm -hmm. she was going to do about and, her and, health care. And that was a good example of your meeting with one-on-one -on -one people and a series of leftist activists ambushed a conversation with this, um, constituents. This was not an Please, activist. Let, she let, was one woman. Let me finish, because we were actually sitting at a coffee shop. But even today. I met with a woman whose husband has cancer um, and was talking through um, their options because he's a veteran and she was very concerned about the services. That's not something you put on Facebook. If you're going to be compassionate, loving to people, listening to them sometimes is the most powerful thing to do and not exploiting them. I completely agree with that. I'm not implying that you should exploit any of our constituents. What I'm saying is come out and have the conversation that this is what you're doing. People have had many numerous occasions where they can't reach your office. The door is locked shut. The mail well, slot is locked or taped shut. But as you know, with the number of threats we've had in our office, even last year, um, the rather difficult, um, well, I'm going to call them threats on my little girl, and the mockery that was made of our concerns when someone's writing you letters wishing your little girl's death. It shows you how dark. Um, we had to bring out the police and the Capitol Police and our office being on the ground floor. They were genuinely concerned. And, and when you think of the Gabby Giffords experience of the safety of our staff, we've actually had to deal with a series of security measures. I, I want to uh, uh, move along here and talk about the district. This kind of coincides with what we're talking about here. The district has 45,000 uh, voter registration advantage mm -hmm. for Republicans. If you were to be elected, how are you going to represent the interests of folks, many of whom might be worried, even as we speak, that you're too liberal for them? Mm -hmm. And certainly David's campaign is putting that messaging out that I'm too liberal for Arizona. Um, that I'm radical is the, the, right, the words you're using. Yes, correct? Um, no, you know what? I come from business. I come from, I've been, in, I'm someone It's here to actually protect capitalism. I'm here to protect our democracy. 
I believe my policies are sound in, ec in economics, but they also care about people. And that's how I'm running this campaign, is you go out in the streets and you talk to people. It doesn't matter to me what their party affiliation is. That's why I know I can represent this district, because I'm not running a campaign that's simply about Democrats. This is about values. This is about families. And people are connecting with that message. It is time that we start to put this party politics aside. We start to stop using negative campaigning and sound bites and talk about real lives. That is how I know I can do this, because I'll tell you, when I launched this campaign, a lot of people thought I was a Republican because I talk about the economy, right? And we think that Democrats don't do that. So it is something that there is common ground. If you run a business, which a lot of our district is based with business owners, you can have that conversation. Conversely, how do you think residents in your congressional district feel about Donald Trump? Well, actually, and I appreciate Ms. Malik's comment about um, the sound bites. And, and, and I think we actually have an agreement that the world is complex, the solutions are complex. Um, uh, Donald Trump won the congressional district, and I actually beat Donald Trump by almost 11 points. So it, it's, it's an interesting, I believe the um, voters in our district are actually rather discerning of who actually is listening to them, but also who is focused on their issues. And, and look, um, uh, Ms. Malik may be a wonderful individual, but we have ideologically we're on opposite ends, um, and 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 that's actually I think healthy, because at least it creates that debate of who has what solutions. And here's I sometimes wish though there'd been more intellectual discourse on okay if if you're way over here and I'm here, is there a mechanism that still serves our society? Your assessment of Donald Trump as president. Um, I could do without the tweets. Um, I believe the economy in some ways is proof of the pudding. When you see how many folks who've, who are finally seeing the stability of employment, um, wages rising, lowest unemployment in my lifetime, at some point do you actually um, value results over rage? A new Pew study uh, from this summer does show that six out of ten voters are going to cast their ballots um, on the congressional races this year based on Trump's performance. How do you rate Trump's performance and uh, his assessment of it? Well, I disagree with David's assessment of Trump's performance. I feel like he has been, you know, very a flip of the switch. Every day it's something different. He has taken our economy, our international presence. Everything has been just a gamble, a game. And if you look at what he's done with tariffs and this tariff war that's going to continue, that is going to affect this, our home district, that economy, for years to come if we don't do something about it. So, no, I don't think his performance is okay. Yeah, I don't like his tweets either, um, particularly what he said today, what's going on with Kavanaugh's hearing. Um, but you know what? That's not it's so much bigger than that. This is a policy point. And I believe that, David, you've stood up beside him and you've aligned with a lot of these votes. A lot of things to dismantle our health care, you know, is not standing up for education in this country. And that's concerning. That's concerning because we have put ourselves in an international sphere where we're, we're kind of being made fun of at this point. And we've lost a lot of allies. That's concerning to me. Once again, um, the facts are the facts. Um, we have the healthiest economy right now in the world. Um, our productivity gains are finally starting again. Um, the reinvestment in capital equipment, um, particularly in this community, is wonderful and it's stunning and actually creates a fairly bright future for us. Um, the other reality is parts of the president's trade agenda, um, as you notice, many of the Democrats in Congress actually don't object to it because in many ways it was very much um, where the Democrat platform was a couple of years ago. Look, China cheats, and I think there's a universal understanding of the stealing of IP, the stealing of these things is unacceptable, but there's a way to deal with it. And, and my personal objection in regards to trade is I wanted us to do a better job building alliances, particularly in rewriting many of the rules at the WTO. And we'll get to the economy and to trade. Um, you mentioned the president's tweets. Are there any other areas of uh, the president's conduct that you take issue with? And have you done enough? And has the Republican Party done enough to voice their objections over some of some of these more troubling um, areas? In some of the things, look, where 
you, you try to focus where you have influence. Um, my focus has been on trade. Well, um, that, but, that's, yeah, that's but, but, not... but that's where you have influence. Um, in some ways, uh, if you spend your, and same with when President Obama was in office, I was not one of those people that every afternoon had to write a press release attacking this or criticizing that. You try to do a combination of respect for the separation of powers and those things that help your community, you push forward. Those things that you believe hurt your state and community, you try to stop or change. You once called a criticism of Trump noise, President Trump noise, and you called it fussing over trite, shiny objects. I think actually that was a very specific complaint at that moment. Regarding Donald, President Trump. Yeah, but, but it was, it was a, a particular question at that moment. I actually somewhat remember the quote. It was um, a question about a specific thing. So uh, be a little careful taking that one out of context. I'm not taking it out of context. You, said, I, you, I you, made, so. you made the statement. Yeah. Uh, do you believe that criticism of Donald Trump is fussing over shy, uh, trite, no. shiny objects? Look, uh, just as there's those who criticize the previous president, um, that's actually the process. It is perfectly okay. When a Republican does it, a Democrat does it, uh, an analyst does it, that's fine. But on occasion, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a recognition of the things that actually are working in our society? Do you believe that, do you believe that Democrats take everything the president says and tweets way too seriously and, and, and take it far too much as far as, as this is a, a disaster for the country and a constitutional mm -hmm. crisis? Right. I think in any other time in our lives, we wouldn't even be having this conversation about a president tweeting. Right. But I think because he is our president, we do need to take everything he says as a serious tweet, as a serious issue that's going to affect our country. What he is saying constantly is things that divide this country. And it is not OK, as you say, that you need to be what, where you can have your most influence. Well, I will tell you something. The people of District 6 feel you have their influence everywhere. Why? Because they've given you their voice to represent them. So your influence should be used to stand up to things that are not okay, to stand up to a man that is denigrating women, that is creating hate throughout our country. And when he goes and he creates, passes with an executive order, a Muslim ban, for example, and you come on this program with Ted and say, well, again, shiny objects, silly, ridiculous, well, people are having... That, that one, actually, that, the, treat, treat me fairly on that one. Um, I was one of those that made it very clear um, I objected to country specific. I wanted actually formulaic um, on security and we had actually had multiple discussions on that. Look, um, you can run a political party on rage, you can run an election on rage, but at a certain point, where's the conversation of saying, taking a step backwards and embracing the good things that are actually happening in our community? And there becomes, um, is it the noise in the message? Do you spend day and night in a state of, 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 of wanting to scream and yell about something you find uncomfortable? Or do you try to figure out what's actually working in your community, working in your society, and how to do more of that? What areas, if elected, what areas um, do you think that you could find common ground with the Trump administration and Republicans on to, to move this country and the state forward? I think health care. I think it's been something that a lot of, you know, of the GOP want to work on. And I think we just haven't had the conversation. We've been so caught in this divide politically that if we just have, we elect some people that can cross that aisle and have that conversation, that's something I would really like to do. Because my big concern with health care is that we have talked about repeal and replace, right? That's what it, the idea is, but there's never been a solution. And then we have this idea of universal health care. Well, what are we doing today? What are we doing today for the millions of Americans that are suffering without coverage, that are going bankrupt? Nothing. Nothing. So that's a big agenda item for me is to go in and protect that and protect programs like Medicare and Social Security, it, things that we uh, can agree that you've said <clears throat> are things that you think need to be cut because that's where the, the deficit and the debt is happening. That is not the case. And, and we I need to protect I those. And I've never used the word cut, but we're going to have to deal with where we are demographically. I need to ask just because it's only fair. Mm -hmm. um, do you support um, Medicare for all or nationalization of health care? I do. Okay. I so, so, but at least you're honest and, and fair about that. Um, I actually have spent lots of time, and, and it's one of my heartbreaks because if it were a previous time and not sort of this, this time of sort of the, the great divide in Washington,
there were things we were trying to do. As you know, I have a fixation on buying down risk. If 5% of our population you know, in healthcare is well over 50% of our cost, and it's mostly people with chronic conditions, how do you help those with chronic conditions, but also help with the cost structure that ends up raising everyone else's? Um, and, and that was an idea that wasn't just a Schweikert idea. There were many Democrats who had actually advocated that same sort of risk, um, invisible risk pools. But the environment had gotten so toxic that when I was able to attach that amendment, even my Democrat friends who liked the idea wouldn't step up and help. And there's actually where Ms. Malik may be correct. If we can get beyond some of the um, divide, there are solutions out there. Look, there's really good news, I believe, coming in the, on the ACA here in Arizona. Uh, as you know, we have only a single choice, and Arizona has been the epicenter for just explosive costs for individuals and that small small groups, even though it's less than 2% of our population. And you're about to see, for the first time, four new providers, so four providers in our community, and even some individual policies going down as much as 22%. For critics of the ACA, mm -hmm. uh, of Obamacare, saying it costs have risen exponentially, options have been shut down regardless of what could be happening mm -hmm. here in the future. One is just simply that that is no option. Mm -hmm. uh, single payer, universal coverage, call it what you will. How is that going to change and help folks, especially those with pre-existing conditions? Because if you don't have a pool of healthy people to help the folks that aren't healthy, you don't have a pool. Right. So. The way I look at getting to a universal system is that we start today. You know, I know that there's a political divide, and what you asked me, Yvonne, is how, how could you work together? For me, this is, you work toward that. You, you take Medicare, where it is now, you bring in the public option, something that was stripped out of that, that original plan of the ACA. You let people buy in. That increases the wellness idea of the marketplace. You make fixes that bring in more providers, which is compete across state lines with still a minimum threshold of standard of care you start to bring efficiencies together. So we already have single payer models in this country. We have Medicare, we have CHIP, the Children's Insurance Program. We have the VA. Bring those together and start to test out this notion while still giving everybody their own plan, this notion of, of having this universal system. We don't have to do it overnight, but we need to get there. And the cost savings, if you put the investment in, just like in anything in business, you have to sometimes have money to make money, right? Put money in, is there. Um, it is going to take some time. And so to your, to your point, there's this idea that you get there with kind of a dual payer system. You have the, mar the marketplace dealing with wellness and prevention, which this country is lacking. Her well, ideas, what, your, your thoughts on those ideas. Uh, well, first off, um, even liberal analysis, I think even the Urban Institute basically said you'd have to double the U.S. tax burden to basically deal with the classic Medicare for all. Um, and remember, um, for every dollar that Medicare has actually collected in FICA taxes over the years. There's functioning an additional $3 that are coming out of the general fund, and that's for our population that is 65 and above. So the greatest unfunded liability in our society is actually Medicare. And then to basically, it, 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 it's, it's an irrational approach. Um, You're letting the, people buy in, remember that. Yeah, but, but, the, the, but, it's but, easy but, to always but, tell but people cost, that there's... But the cost per coverage, would be dramatically more than many of the individual and other types of policies. There are, if, if ultimately our goal is universal coverage, um, no pre-existing condition, guaranteed issue, well, we're actually already at guaranteed issue and pre-existing coverage. Now, actually, the last thing somewhere in there is some risk mitigation. And it turns out um, there's some revolutions, I think, are happening, everything through technology and others, that may actually get us to the common goal. I just, my fear is that nationalized health care is a horrible way to move that. Through. Federal government paying money directly, directly to insurance firms as a way of transitioning to something different and better than now. Good idea? No, actually it didn't work. As, as you remember, we had something called the risk corridors as part of the ACA. Um, and when you actually added up the subsidies to insurance companies, the money's paid, the levels of the premiums and everything else, you actually start to realize the actual cost of that health care dollar were dramatically higher than the private policies that had been put out of business a couple of years earlier. Not going to work? You know, I mean, I think, look, there's this 
idea that we need to keep this insurance market in play and not go to nationalized health care. That's where you really wanted to focus. And I, you know, I knew you were going to use the word nationalized. I've been following how you've been speaking about this, that Democrats just want to go to this one route. Um, let's be honest. You've taken a lot of money from insurance companies for your campaign just in the last year. So for me, the concern is the insurance is a layer. And we don't need to get rid of it completely, like I said. We need to have dual payer system. But to say that you can't, you can't decrease the risk is, is not OK. You've got to give people a baseline insurance program, and that is Medicare. If they have a baseline insurance program, we can bring health and wellness into this country and preventive medicine. And we're not doing that. That's just not what even the most liberal think tanks have said in their analysis of the math. Uh, look, the, the goals are laudable. Um, and look, I'm actually one of those who's incredibly optimistic because I actually believe there's a revolution on the cusp. As you see, um, the HHS secretary is about to start allowing reimportation of generic drugs. Um, some of the um, uh, uh, some of the bonus system, some of the um, rebate system within pharmaceutical is about to. But, so there's actually some really neat changes that I'm hopeful both Republicans and Democrats, because it's something we've all been asking for, is to start changing the bad incentives within the system. Can I just then do one follow-up on that? So then are you okay with Medicare being able to negotiate for pharmaceutical it, it, prescription it, drugs? It, actually, I, I am, but it, it's within the mechanisms of you're going to have to actually deal with sort of the, the rebate systems where those have been actually sort of coming in the back door. Well, rebates on Part and, D, of course, but I'm well, talking but, but, about but, in but, general. But, but, there's other like, types, but there's other types, actually, that I believe create distortions. I would, I'm one of those, I really, really want to see visibility in pricing. And actually, um, I know it's a bit of an outlier, but I, for a long time, I've actually been a fan of um, reimportation from industrialized countries, particularly on generics, for that competition. Does the U.S. have a moral responsibility to provide affordable, affordable health care for its citizens? Oh, I actually believe so. And actually, that's why you have programs like CHIP. Here in Arizona, um, as, a, as a younger man, I actually did the budgets for access um, for a short time. And I think actually, when you think about it, um, what is it, 20 percent of our state's population is on the Arizona uh, health care cost containment system. And it's actually been a fairly healthy model. There is an opportunity to use something like access, which is functionally buying an HMO policy for folks of lower income, and using that as a mechanism for risk mitigation. Anita. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely something we need to do morally. To me, health care is a right. And I think to constantly say that we need to bring in you know, insurance companies and look at the risk and look at the numbers, I agree with you. Look, we both are data people. We both like to talk about the numbers. But the fundamental issue is we're not moving in that direction. We're trying to always look at this from a political lens, and that's not okay. It's not a political tool to play leverage with. And that's what my concern is. And I'm saying this because you voted for a bill that would take $880 million away from Medicaid. If you really believe it's our moral obligation, you wouldn't have done that. That actually isn't how it worked, but that would take a while to walk through the, the okay. mechanism. Again, with the so, it's always the condescension. condescension. Explain it. Yes, I'm sure we have a couple for all of us, um, to hear but, about but, it. Yeah. But the, the neat thing is that we, we're having this conversation. Um, on the Medicaid um, mechanisms, um, you had actually states that had done expansion, not expansion. Uh, Arizona wa was an expansion state, so there was a formula that was going to allow states to actually do much more creative things with a block grant as our own governor and others in even Democrat states were asking for the ability to manage in a more creative fashion than a bureaucratic controlled fashion. And within that, the model over a decade had some huge savings. So for the people in the middle class, people who might not qualify for those types of programs, mm -hmm. health care still is out of reach for many of those. And I think these are um, the people who oftentimes are left behind in this conversation. And those are the people that you seem to be talking about. Yes. Yes, for sure. You know, you look at our district, people always want to talk about how District 6 is affluent, that it's wealthy. Um, you know, the median income is about for a household is about $60,000, actually a little bit less. 18% of 18-year-olds in our district, under 18-year-olds, live in poverty. There are people that have a need for these resources. And when we continue to see votes that you are making that are aligning with the Trump agenda, 
that are cutting these things and cutting pre-existing conditions. And I know you've tried to put in an amendment and risk pools and all that, but you also voted for something that take, gives the states the option to take those pre-existing conditions away. It, it actually, it, it didn't actually do that. You had to do file a whole series of plans to demonstrate. And remember, there's the line in there that made it very clear. You could not do anything to lessen availability and coverage. But somehow we seem to forget that line, which was somewhat critical. And I don't think you can find a, a single vote I've ever made um, um, not protecting those children. I have a fixation on, on um, I worked hard for the continuation of CHIP and to actually get it so it stopped being a yo-yo and a political tool that we had a much longer extension. And, and that's one of the, my accomplishments, I did, believe. Did you do everything you could have done to help the Affordable Care Act as opposed to fight the Affordable Care Act? I actually think in some ways because there were structural designs that didn't make sense. If you, like your previous question, when you actually started to walk through everything, we'll call it the risk pools, the subsidies to the insurance companies, in many ways, the very ACA end up becoming an insurance company bailout design. Um, and it, it ended up creating these distortions of risk. Look, I'll do this really quickly. When the prices shot up, you actually had a whole lot of our population that, that would have been there in that individual small group market, that their prices were so high, they dropped out. And you ended up in this ratcheting effect where you had sort of this, the, 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 if you were a high user, sicker, chronic, you were staying in, and our healthy population was leaving. My fixation on the ACA is how did I lower, how could we lower the price for that younger, healthier population to participate and therefore lower the price for everyone? Do you think that Representative Schweikert and the Republicans in general did all they could to help the Affordable Care Act? No. You know, I always say in business, you create a pro in tech, we create products. We launch them into the market. We know they're going to have bugs. Things go wrong. The iPhone used to be a brick, right? You put it out in the market and people test, people go through things. That is what you can expect from a huge health care plan like the ACA that was dumped onto this country. There's going to be problems. But what you've done is turned your back on it. Instead of working toward a solution, fixing those gaps, fixing those holes. And so, no, the answer is no, they did not. Well, for some, iPhone wasn't a brick and <laughs> it wasn't dumped on. Um, the re that's just Opinions. not the reality. <laughs> I, I've spent, you know, the last couple of years being basically um, the advocate um, for the risk mitigation because, once again, if 5% of our population with chronic illness is well over 50% of our cost, turns out that may be the elegant solution of if we can help that population, we can actually lower everyone's. And these are for people who have employer-based health care to the individual who's buying in the individual market. Um, there is a solution, and it's not partisan. It's basically a bunch of tables of math, and I think there's a way to get there. But my fear is um, the angst has sort of blinded so many people to sit down and say, how do we get there? Congressman, uh, the economy is doing obviously a lot better now. Uh, your party, you say that it is in part because of tax cuts. Um, you have said that these tax cuts would help long term. Will this mm -hmm. last? Um, I actually believe so. And look, I had the blessing of two weeks ago spending 45 minutes with the Federal Reserve Chairman in my office. A really detailed conversation um, of saying, you know, we have not had out of mean inflation since 1994. Um, the scale of economic activity in the country in the last nine months has far exceeded everything we guessed and modeled. Um, and his comment was he sees nothing, nothing on the horizon to end this growth cycle. And that's coming from the Federal Reserve Chairman. And do remember, for the tax reform, we only needed a 0.4% growth over this decade to pay for it. And we were scheduled to be at 0.18% GDP growth for the next 10 years. So we were in this growth recession. And yeah. today, the Federal Reserve actually has us at 4.4. I mean, it, there's something wonderful happening. I think whoever you know is in Washington or is in public policy, I think we have a, a social moral obligation to keep this growth cycle going as do we long have as a, possible. Do we have a social and moral obligation to look at the country's debt, which oh, is increasing, and some are blaming the tax cut 
for the exponential increase in the debt. And you actually um, have to break down the math. Um, over the last 10 years, 72% of all spending increase were functioning two programs, Social Security and Medicare. Now that you have the tax reform, if we can keep up this economic expansion, the debt the debt to GDP number mm -hmm. looks like we can flatline it. But the fact of the matter is we still have the demographic issues of our society. We're going to have to do something. It's holistic. It's going to have to be immigration. So it's you're going to have to be trade. It's going to have to be technology. You're not a proponent of deficit spending then? Because um, that's, what, that's what I'm hearing right now from Republicans. Um, the, the fact of the matter is there's almost no mathematical way to wake up tomorrow and with where we are in the aging of our population. So in, in, it's, it's just math, and it's the demographics. And the fact that if you end up in Washington, you find out you work in a math-free zone, is how do we actually, as a society, make it through our baby boom demographic? The zone? math says, regardless of tax cuts, mm -hmm. These, this debt, these deficit, they will be there, and there's nothing you can do about it because 2 plus 2 equals 4. Right, so add some more to it, right? Create some tax cuts that were not needed to fuel the economy, that are not the source of what has happened with this economy. We've been building out of this recession for 10 years now. This is, did not happen in the last year because of those tax cuts. And the economy is not doing good for everyone. The economy is doing good for a certain class of people who participate in the stock market. And I will tell you, the average American doesn't have, <clears throat> excuse me, the funds right now to participate in the stock market. And that's, please, I'll let you finish and don't interrupt. And so when I look at the economy, I look at the cost of living. If we have little spikes of little bonuses here and there, and we've seen that bonus income per, per maybe the tax breaks has gone up more significantly than wages. It's an easy band-aid, a way to say, here's a little bit of money. Let's, you know, give you some extra bonuses. Fine. Those things are not long term. The cost of education, the cost of health care, the fact that we don't have equal pay in this country, and that is a crippling economic issue for mm -hmm. families. All of it. You add this all together and you realize that's the burden that we're seeing with the economy. And that's affecting the majority of Americans. And it's and, and once again, um, I, uh, I appreciate your passion, but your math is wrong. Um, I didn't, and, actually, and, and, I didn't and, actually say any math. Well, actually, but. no, no, you did. Because actually, if someone right now will just go on to the um, Bureau of Labor Statistics website, take a look at the point, or excuse me, the 1.4 percent growth in income. That's less inflation. Um, and it's mostly, if you look at it, that's actually most in the working middle class, the blue collar. And actually, the biggest spike in income are those who don't have high school educations. The fact of the matter is there's something amazing happening right now inside the economy. I absolutely agree, um, and, and I'm a sponsor also on a piece of legislation um, for equal pay enforcement. I think that's only fair. We have the laws. We now need to actually enforce them. But we're only nine months into this um, economic renaissance. What do we do policy-wise to keep it going as long as possible? The so, okay. lower income and the, the middle class, right. obviously, uh, your argument is they are not really feeling the effects of, of this right. um, so-called renaissance. No. How do you make it more fair? How do you help them feel that uh, benefit? That benefit. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think the average person is getting maybe $20 here and there a week back from this tax cut, right, if they're getting anything at all. So, no, the average person is not feeling that. You know, I think... Your party's made some great references to Costco and things like that that you think we want to pay for. But really, the way we make this fair is to address the, those costs, the costs that are affecting this nation, such as health care, such as education. Having an entire generation strapped with college debt that we're not letting them refinance that as a financial tool is unacceptable. There are so many places where our money, our day-to-day -day paycheck is being stretched. And it's not okay. That's what got me into this race, is because you look at the idea of the American dream. That idea is that you can do something better for your, for the next yeah. generation, for your kids. But, but, but I think Representative Schweikert has said on a number of occasions now that with this tax cut, there is something happening with that middle class. It is. It, it is. He is saying that income has gone up at the lowest levels. But is it enough to actually compete with this cost of living? No, yes. That's no, the no, problem. no, 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 you no. Actually, those numbers are stripped out of uh, inflation. Okay, a couple things. First off, um, the functional nationalization of student debt happened under the last time the Democrats controlled the body. I'm those not running against the, the past. Okay, I'm running against now, finish. and I want to know what you'll do about it now. Please let me finish. 
Um, so those of us in the Ways and Means Committee are actually working on a couple ideas of how to use everything from some 529 resources to others to be able to help us all, because I still have student debt from grad school, so <laughs> I understand this. Um, the fact of the matter is if you actually look at what's going on in our community, this has actually been some of the most optimistic, and the data actually says um, optimism from, from those who are wealthy, or high income earners, all the way down the, is the highest it's been in my life. You, you, you can keep referencing actually, but, data. But you can't have it both ways. You can't sit there and badmouth the economy and at the same time see the survey. It says, but it's also our public is the most optimistic they've been in my lifetime. Right. However, you also have people that are now living in your district that have small businesses that are very concerned about their future because of these tariffs. You also have people that can't make and ends I do, meet I do agree because with you on the tariffs. of health care. Those factors are there regardless, again, of what you want to look at with the economy and the stock market. Yes, it's so, booming, but we've been here before, 10 years ago with this recession. There was an amazing amount of wealth traveling through this country, and it was to, it, with the housing industry, and people were... Crippling. But, 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 but we were crippling but, but, but a different actually, class of people. You're actually making a great point there. We had a wealth concentration. It was from housing and real estate. The elegant thing that's happening right now is it's across the board. And now if you actually see with some of the administrative, some things we've done policy-wise um, on ACA pricing that's coming in, it's going to be actually flat or going down. Availability is going up. So we've actually made some progress there. The tariffs, you and I absolutely agree. And I'm hoping we can actually move um, the ball on that. I'm going to interrupt here. We are running out of time. Want to get to a quick issue. Where are you on the border wall? Um, I'm actually a fan of border security. But and in urban areas, in populated areas, absolutely you must have a physical barrier. But being someone who's backpacked the Chiricahuas, you're not building a wall up to the Chiricahuas. There's areas where it's going to have to be technology. So no continuous border wall. You, 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 it would be physically impossible. Anita. I'm definitely against the wall. I'm surprised to see that that's also your answer. Um, as you know, you did film an ad that actually puts you right there with the wall and supporting the wall. So. In, in, a, in a populated area. Because as you know, we have a problem of um, in, in areas where someone's been able to make it into Nogales, all of a sudden the um, immigration rules change of being able to identify that individual. Very quickly, where do you stand on President Donald Trump's policy of separating uh, children from their parents. Absolutely opposed it. And I think I was one of the very first Republicans to come out and um, ask for it to be stopped. Anita. As your constituent, I want to say you did say something, but you had a conditional statement after that. You said, I would never see kids taken away from their parents, but, and made an excuse for we can't let them just come in and think it's okay to come in. That it was an okay tactic almost, a fear tactic. You did say that. As your constituent, I was alarmed. And I'm completely against the separation of Respond, families. Please. We both have uh, little kids. We both yeah, have three-year-olds. We, we both have, we both have you three-year-olds. You can picture that. And actually, families. at some point, when this is all over, we'll do a play date. Sure. Um, look, I'm sorry you objected to the but, but it's... Uh, you can't but, put a conditional but, statement but, but, but on but ripping uh, kids do, away from their parents. And, and I opposed it. And I was very public and very quick about that. There's always a conditional you also, statement, David. But you always. also have to deal with the reality that the vast majority of children and I went down there. Remember, I went down there. Um, were children that didn't have families. They were basically being handed a card to read and being abandoned at the border crossing. Um, but those technically aren't separated from their families. But that's it. So you actually have to see it all in context because many of those ended up in the same housing issues. We've got to stop right there. Uh, very good debate. Time for closing statements and going in reverse order of our opening remarks. We start with Anita Malik. Well, thank you again for joining us. Thank you for our hosts. Um, and thank you, Mr. Schweikert, for joining me here today and having this conversation. You know, my opponent has been negative at attacks, has been known for name calling and, and negative attacks. I'd like to see vision, not division in this country. I am running to bring forward ideas that will bring us to a new place where we do have economic, true economic equality, where our kids can go to school and feel safe because our politicians are not bought by special interests and corporate interests. I'm here to keep our, all our families together, not just those at the border, but our families here in District 6 as well, to, prevent, to talk about the opioid crisis, to talk about why we don't have health care and why we are dying from that, to bring preventative care into this market. This is about our families so that we can not only survive paycheck to paycheck, but we can thrive. I hope to earn your vote. All right.
And now the closing statement from Representative David Schweikert. Well, look, um, and I'm sad for the negativity of the fact of the matter is there's good things happening in our society right now. If you actually look at the, the employment market, how far we've come, how many of our brothers and sisters out there who have had a really rough decade you know, with the growth recession are now back actually seeing their home values, their savings, um, and now their incomes growing. There are solutions, whether it be in healthcare and the willingness to adopt technology, to adopt um, methods of, we call them digital pseudicals in my office, to embrace creativity. I believe I've actually been very, very blessed to hold this job. Um, and when I leave, I'm hoping my success is I've made my country, my community better, and actually made the world better for my three-year-old. Um, there's good things happening. I just need to have more of it continue. All right. Thank you very much. You've been watching Arizona Horizons debate for Congressional District 6, brought to you by Arizona PBS and the Arizona Republic. Thanks to the candidates for their participation, and thank you so much for watching. I'm Yvonne Winget Sanchez. And I'm Ted Simons. Remember, tune in Monday to Arizona Horizon for our governor's debate. That's right here on Arizona Horizon. Thanks for joining us tonight. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible.